Hey there, hey there team. Let's dig a little bit more into light. So we've already covered, you know, how we characterize light through amplitude and frequency and wavelength and speed of light, which is mostly what we're going to do with our mathematics. And we looked at the electromagnetic spectrum, my favorite talk. Yay! I, oh, I could have done so much more on that. <laughs> Just each one of the little things I could have probably done a whole video on. But let's take a look a little more in the realm of physics. Um, oh, oh, sorry for cursing. A little more. <laughs> so I'm not going to go into the mathematics. If you're into the, that kind of stuff, hey, dig into it all you want. Google away. But let's look at some of the wave properties of light because we're tre treating, at, for now, we're treating wave, uh, you know, moving as a transverse wave, okay? We're going to look at the particle nature of light later. We got to get into Einstein and some important individuals and Planck and Einstein. We'll do that in uh, probably the next video or two. Um, gets a little kooky. When we get to quantum mechanics, it gets a little weird. So be prepared to have your favorite beverage. This will be important when we start to try to characterize electrons and electron motion. So we want to understand um, what are some basic things about waves. Right? Well, you know, whether they're waves, sound waves, light waves, doesn't matter. But waves in general have three main properties or or uh, phenomena they undergo, which proves that they are moving as a wave. If one of these three things happened, if we ran an experiment and we were testing something and it underwent one of these three, we would go, boom, only waves do that. So again, avoiding the gnarly physics and mathematics of it with all these signs and all this fun stuff. Let's take a look at these three. So one is interference, and we'll look at each one in, you know, individually. We'll do a board for each one. So interference is one, uh, which I learned as a kid. Uh, you know, tubing on the lakes in Minnesota with my grandma. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, some, of the, some of these things you understand, I think, just conceptually or at a gut instinctive level. You don't have to understand the physics behind it. So interference and waves, especially, you know, like in our case, light, uh, white light contains lots of different wavelengths ranging from, you know, 400-ish nanometers to, you know, 750-ish, 800 nanometer range. But, you know, we've got the reds and the oranges and the yellows, and each and in, under red there's different shades of red, under blue there's different shades of blue. Um, but we can separate those wavelengths. White is all colors, right? We can separate those out into like its rainbow, its spectrum, into individual wavelengths. That's called dispersion, dispersion. So waves can be dispersed and the wave, individual wavelengths separated. So it's coming in, it goes shoop, into individual wavelengths and we can actually see those colors. You ever see it like a, back in the day when we had CD, CDs in our cars and people would hang them from their, their sunshade and then the sun would hit it and uh, reflect off and you would see, you know, that little wave, the, the rainbow off of it. So we'll look at stuff like that. So... We'll look at diffraction as one way to disperse those individual wavelengths out, and we'll look at refraction as a way uh, to do that, just real briefly. My most important one will be interference for us when we're looking at electron motion later. So let's start with that, interference. All right, this is my personal favorite out of all of these, although I do like diffraction, it's kind of cool. We use diffraction gratings in labs, but that'll be, you know, probably maybe a higher level lab or whatever, but constructive interference rocks. So when two or more waves interact, so I've got one wave number one, wave number two, whoopang, right? Let's say they interact. Could be three waves, could be four. It gets really complicated, so we'll just focus on two. Those waves can add together or they can subtract from each other. So the first one is if they add together, they're said to be in phase. So the crest or peak of one is the same as the crest or peak as the other, and the trough of the other is, is the same as the trough of wave one and wave two. Now, we're just going to make this oversimplifying case that they're completely in phase. It's possible they could be slightly out of phase and still, you know, add together. But let's say we've got this purple wave, wave A, right? It's got an amplitude, it's got a wavelength, yada, yada, yada. And let's look, look at wave B, the blue one. Do you see that it's complete? It looks identical to it. So you can literally look through and say, well, this peak matches that peak. That trough, if I could draw a straight line, matches that one. So these are called in phase. Those two are in phase. Now, again, it could be shifted a little bit and be slightly out of phase. 
but still add together, it just wouldn't add as completely. So if they're completely in phase like this, the amplitude of that one adds to the amplitude of that one. And so you get a single wave with double the amplitude. You see that? Much larger than amplitude. So my grandma understood this when I was a kid. I had tons of cousins. I was the only guy for a long time. <laughs> All right. So it's just like so I have three daughters and one son that's just the, the trend it'd be like you know seven girls seven girls for every guy with all the cousins it was pretty crazy I don't know the exact number it was a lot and, and I was the eldest male of all you know 40 50 cousins or whatever just crazy my grandma man she'd take us out now this is a long time ago back when you'd go inner tubing but the you didn't have these nice whatever nylon cords it was a rope I mean you <laughs> Oh, you get the friction burns, and the inner tube was actually a big black inner tube with the little spout hanging off where you <laughs> blow into it, right? <laughs> Just very tame. We get hurt all the time. And so, you know, she'd take some of the younger uh, cousins out there, and she'd have her little hat on. She'd put them around the lake and whatever and have fun. And then whenever I got up there, she'd sit there and she'd turn her hat around and I knew I was doomed. I just knew it. She ended up having a lot of strokes and stuff and, and uh, had some trouble, but never lost that feistiness, man. It's just, <laughs> she's, she's out to destroy me, I'll tell you that. And she'd come around the lake, and I don't know if you've ever done this before, where you're cruising around a lake. So you can see how they constructively interfere like this. So get a rough idea how this, this happens. I probably shouldn't draw this. <laughs> but to get the basic idea, imagine this is the lake, right? And so my grandma would drive real fast coming this way in the boat, and I'd be tied behind on this little rope and an inner tube. And then she'd go, Nee, and then she'd go, boom, really slow. And just, boom, and you'd see these waves come flying off. And then she'd go in a circle like this, right? And she'd create these huge waves. So these, they'd be these huge waves that would meet in the middle, the death center, the center of death. And these waves, and somehow she was able to get it. You know what I mean? Where she could, you know, after you practice enough, she maybe she couldn't explain interference to me using physics, but she could go crush me on the inner tube. And these waves would meet together and constructively interfere in the middle. So you get these, you know, one or two foot waves coming in from the going real slow and they'd meet and you'd get these huge waves in the middle. I'd be like, oh, and then she'd make them and then she would go this way and go real fast and then come around and she would do a drive by and it would send me right in the middle. I'd be like, ah, right? I'd be toast. You like the artwork there? <laughs> But I would see that coming, and she'd go flying by, and she'd fling me right in on that inner tube, and this would be me. Yay! Oh, so I'd hit it here, and then I'd go flying up, and I'd be like, oh, that hurt really bad. And then I would go into there and dislocate my shoulder. And then I would just kind of lay there. Oh, she actually got my shorts to fly off once. <laughs> It's crazy. She'd wipe me out, man. This my shoulders all messed up, and I would just see these huge waves in the middle and just go ah, fly. You'd go airborne, and then you land in the trough there. <laughs> Fun stuff. So anyway, so that was the one she wiped out. So she understood constructive interference, right? So let's take a look at destructive interference. Now, this will be important later, again, when we're looking at electrons moving around the nucleus. This is going to be something that will come back and haunt us. Let's look at, sorry for the little segue there, but it brings back great memories of pain. <laughs> let's look at destructive interference. All right, for destructive interference, it's just the opposite, right? So you've got these two A's that are combining, but they're completely out of phase. That's what I wish my grandma would have done when she went around. If she'd like making the circle bigger or smaller, she could have had those waves subtract from each other rather than enhance each other and wipe me out, right? She could have made it nice and smooth. If she was able to get perfect destructive interference, it would have been nice and nice and calm inside that that circle of death that <laughs> she did the boat around. So she knew how just how big to make it just to wipe me out. So if the waves are out of phase, so maybe the peak of one or the crest of one lines up with the trough of the other, right? So they're almost like completely out of sync there. They'll subtract and potentially, potentially completely cancel each other out in an extreme case. So here's wave A, the purple, similar to what we had with the constructive interference. And then wave B, the blue, notice when wave A goes up, wave B goes down. So when the peak of the wave A 
lines up with the trough of wave B. If those amplitudes are the same, they're going to cancel out. And so the trough of this one lines up with the peak of that one. So those are completely out of phase. So when they add together, you'll get diddly squat. They could completely cancel out. Now, if they're slightly shifted from each other, you'll get destructive interference, but you get much smaller uh, peaks over on that side. So pretty straightforward. So constructive, destructive interference. I think it's a fairly simple concept. We'll just qualitatively look at it. We won't look at the mathematics of it. So let's look at diffract dispersion of specifically for us white light into its individual colors or wavelengths by diffraction and refraction. Let's do diffraction first because we're going to do that in lab. Woohoo! So I'm pretty sure you've seen the dispersion of, of sunlight by diffraction, like I said, like off of a CD or something like that. Um, oversimplification, but I just want you to get the basic point, right? So the dispersion of light or the separation into its individual colors or wavelengths, creating a spectrum. Due to the reflection of that light off of a grooved surface, and the resulting interference of the waves, you get constructive and destructive interference of those waves bouncing off. So these, so white light hits the grooves. You see the grooves, like on the edge of a saw or something like that, although they're machined quite precisely. It all depends on the distance between the grooves and the angle of the light and all this wonderful physics you're welcome to read about that I'm not going to talk about. We're just qualitatively looking at these light properties. So the light reflects off and the different colors reflect off at different angles. And so what happens is you will actually see the spread. So it's kind of a reverse rainbow. Instead of Rajibib, it's Vibgyor. I mean, Vibgyor. So you can set the violet, the indigo, the blue, the green, the yellow, the orange, and the red. And you can actually see it coming off. There's some cool pictures. This is kind of obviously, you know, enhanced so you can see it. Um, but we're going to use a diffraction grading. I don't think we're going to do it first semester of general chemistry in lab. Some places do. We'll do it second semester for sure. Uh, and what's fun about this is we can create, take this white light, which has all many colors, or we call it polychromatic radiation. And then we disperse it. And what we can do is we could set up what's called a monochromator, right, with a diffraction grading in it. And then we can isolate any one of these wavelengths. Literally, we could just take, let's just take this one right here, this green one. Or we'll just take, you know, 452.3 nanometers or something. It's pretty cool. And put it through a slit. And then we have a single wavelength or a monochromatic radiation. And then we can strike a sample with that and see if that particular solution or whatever absorbs or how much it absorbs of that particular wavelength. It's kind of neat. But in, in our lab, this, is, this setup is called a monochromator, and this is one component of the monochromator. Cool stuff if you're into that kind of stuff. Take analytical chemistry. you got to open up the machines and dig through the guts and go, how does that work? How does that work? It's like opening the engine of a car and going, what's that? What's that? What's that? And then understanding each individual piece, putting it all back together and seeing how it works as a whole. It's really cool. So I highly recommend analytical chemistry. Um, not necessary if you're not a chemistry major, but... It's a really cool class. It was one of my favorite chemistry classes of all time. Um, so anyway, pretty neat, huh? We're going to get the same net result from refraction. This is how we'll end up, but the cause of it is slightly different. Let's take a look at refraction. This will be a quick video. All right, refraction you have seen. I know you've seen it. You've all seen rainbows, correct? After you get, well, this is Southern California. It hardly ever rains, but, you know, maybe every other year or so it'll rain and you might, oh, look, it's a rainbow or maybe even a double rainbow. <laughs> that happened at school one time and everybody just, people were pointing up in the parking lot outside the lab and then more people came out and everybody started rushing out of the lab and there must have been 20 or 30 people with their cell phones taking videos. It was just the most beautiful double rainbow I'd ever seen. Everybody's like, oh, I'm like, watch out, you're going to get hit by a car. And, you know, it's, you don't see it often down here. But it's so beautiful. Nature's amazing beauty. It, it, rainbows, I think, never cease to amaze, at least me. Have you ever chased one, too? Tried to find? I'm like, I know I can find that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Never was able to do it. <laughs> but I tried. Trust me. So refraction is, you know, we're going to end up getting the dispersion of light, just we, like we did with diffraction. But the cause is different. So what happens? And I'll have to show it a, a picture of it on the next board. But you have the polychromatic uh, sunlight or white light coming in. And when light travels from one medium to another with a different index of refraction, like from air into like a, a prism made of some kind of plastic or into water in a lake or something, 
it can slow down or speed up. Now we're 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 making the assumption the speed of light's constant. You know, like the value I gave you, two point nine nine seven nine two five times ten to the eighth meters per second. I think it is. Um, that's the speed of light in the vacuum, and we're just going to treat it with that value and assume it's a constant for all our calculations. But really, when light comes through and hits water, it slows down a little bit and it bends, right? But each wavelength can bend bends at a slightly different angle. I think blue light bends more than red light. So we get this interesting phenomena where, uh, for example, as, as sunlight hits a, a water droplet, when it travels from the air into the water, all the angles bend, right? All the, all the wavelengths bend. And then as it exits, it bends again, and it comes out exactly the same way every single time. Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. It's so cool. Avoiding the mathematics or just qualitatively looking at it. Um, but yeah, that different index of refraction, there's some fun things you could do for it. It's like it's when I do like science magic shows and stuff. If you get a Pyrex glass, like a big beaker, fill it with canola oil, they have roughly the same index of refraction, so they bend light at the same angle. And you can take another Pyrex beaker that's smaller and put it inside there. It's just, you don't even know it's there. You can't see it. It's invisible. And then I take a big Pyrex glass rod, and, and I talk to kids, and I put the rod in, and as the rod enters the canola oil, you can't see it anymore. And then they, they're like, ooh, and pull it out. When they're all done, I take tongs and pull the smaller beaker out of the bigger one. The, Whoa, they didn't even know it was there. It was so cool. <laughs> it's so simple, but you can teach them. You know, it's a little more physics than chemistry per se, I guess, but there's a lot of overlap between physics and chemistry. You can't get away, you know. Just take the class physical chemistry. Oh, I survived peak chem. Blah. Let's take a look at uh, a pictorial look at refraction and, and see if it looks familiar to you. All right, refraction, do you see the same net result? You start with polychromatic white radiation. Boom, hits it. Now what's different, and this time it's not, diffraction is where it's scattering off a surface and you get the interference coming off, causing the dispersion. Here, the we say this is air and light's cruising along and it hits this prism made of some other material with a different index of refraction and the light slows down. But the colors all bend at different angles. Look up the math if you want to. And so red, so the, the darker colors here bend at higher, uh, larger angles than the reds. And so you start to see the separation inside the prism. Uh, and then it hits the edge and it goes back into the air again and changes speed again. And then you see a pretty distinct separation or dispersion of the colors and you get that rainbow. You can imagine this is a rain droplet. Yeah, you get some scattering off the inside of it and stuff like that. But it's the same principle of why you get uh, rainbows after a rainy day uh, when, the, when the clouds break and the sun comes out, that sunlight's going through the rain droplets uh, and you get the dispersion of light from refraction. It's pretty cool, a little more complicated than that, but it's neat. So we could use this as well instead of a diffraction grading if we wanted. I actually have one of these in my office, which I can't get to right now because the college is locked down. <laughs> no, uh, be pretty too, tough to do, but if I had you know kind of a darker room, I could shine some white light through there and you could actually see it undergo dispersion through the prism. It's really neat. But there's some properties of light, so remember interference, especially when we talk about electron motion later, diffraction, we're going to hit that in lab, and refraction next time you see a rainbow. Think about this. Sweet! Let's get to the juicy stuff next.